Cool, awesome. Huh. Uh, Mike, also for the room, fine. You guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Uh, already spoilers. <laughs> uh, hey guys, my name is Fauzi. I'm a studio game design director here at King in Berlin. Um, we're the company. We're the mobile arm of Activision Blizzard. We are, we make games such as Candy Crush Saga, Candy Crush Soda Saga, and Candy Crush Jelly Saga. <laughs> Um, part of Activision Blizzard, Activision, the guys that uh, we've re been releasing over the past year, Destiny 2, um, uh, uh, World of Warcraft, and much other games like that. I'll tell you guys a little bit about myself today. I'm going to speak to you guys about game mechanics. We'll get to that in a second. Tell you a little bit about me first. This is a bit laggy. Should I point somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> it's making a sound, but it's not. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I can do it manually. <laughs> so I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I've been a game designer for 15 years. Uh, this year I've worked on uh, around 20 games at this point. Uh, I'm from Jordan, that's where I started my career. Uh, and throughout the course of my career I worked at a bunch of companies, a bunch of different platforms, worked on uh, PC games, Xbox games. Uh, first game was on the Game Boy Advance actually. Um, iOS, Facebook and a whole bunch of others. I uh, worked uh, here at King in Berlin. I, uh, before that, I was in Japan. I worked at a company called Inish. We worked on a bunch of games for a while. Uh, I was before that in New Zealand, a game loft, working games like uh, Minion Rush, uh, My Little Pony, uh, Friendship's Magic, and a bunch of other games, Ice Age Adventures, uh, one of them. Before that, I worked at a company called Atlas. Uh, we worked on the Persona franchise. I worked on the third uh, installment uh, briefly. Uh, I'm also a competitive gamer. I really like to play video games as well, so I used to be... Um, uh, used to be a competitive game, actually, it's a better way to, to place it. Uh, it was third place national finalist in StarCraft and uh, uh, fifth place national finalist in Street Fighter for Arcade Edition for a while. Uh, tell you. Sure. Click. <laughs> uh, so, today I'm going to speak to you guys about uh, game mechanics. So, this is going to be a, a bit of a theory game design, so please humor me and be f feel free to jump in and. Uh, Tell me that you're crazy so we can have a conversation about this. Um, we often talk about game mechanics as the foundations of uh, what games are. And uh, today I'm going to like try to find a, a way to define what game mechanics are. Um, first of all, show of hands, have any of you guys ever read a book called The Art of Game Design, Book of Lenses? Cool. Uh, for you guys, there's going to be a bit of a revision there. For you, for you guys who don't, I hope you would because I think it's a very valuable book. I will also present a bunch of... Uh, References and other books that I would recommend you guys read at the end of the at the end of this as well. Cool. So uh, game mechanics basically is the core of what the game is. So uh, it's basically when you strip away all aesthetic, uh, all the graphics and everything, it's uh, it's what remains then uh, when you remove everything away. So this is a bit broad. So we're gonna try to break it down into several aspects so that we can define it a little bit better. So in in essence, game mechanics are space. Objects, actions, rules, and skills. And we'll uh, try to uh, explain a little bit of those uh, uh, one at a time. So space, uh, click. Yep. <laughs> uh, so space is basically um, as, yes please, thank you. Uh, so if you think of it as a mathematical object, it's an abstraction, but it's basically where the game's taking place. So it defines the various places in which uh, the game and the objects and everything within the game is taking place and how they relate to each other. So if we move on to the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, sorry. So um, there are multiple ways that you can um, uh, describe spaces. Uh, spaces could be discrete or continuous. I'll, I'll explain that in a second. They can have any number of dimensions from zero to n dimensions and have bounded areas in which may or may not be connected. So uh, spaces usually have boundaries that are predefined. There's a lot to take in, I know we'll break it down a little bit, one, one at a time. And this is working again, so it makes things a lot easier. Let's consider the space of tic-tac-toe, right? If you, if you look at the space of tic-tac-toe, you would probably consider it as a 2D space, right? If you, if you consider that uh, the placement of an X uh, within a tic-tac-toe board in these three examples, the placement of the X itself within the cell does not make any difference. The location of the X within the middle of the uh, cell is what, makes it, is what makes all the difference, right? So moving it aside within the cell makes absolutely no difference in terms of gameplay. But if we do this, then um, 
changes everything entirely in terms of what the gameplay is. So we come to the feeling that this is a, a, a space in which uh, the cells themselves they don't have uh, the location of the item within the cell itself doesn't hold meaning, but the location of the adjacency of those cells is what hold the meaning. So this is how we're starting to define the space a little bit further. So, so basically, if you, can, if you try to describe the space, it's a series of maybe nine um, zero-dimensional spaces that are adjacent to each other. The dots represent where are all the, the spaces that, were, that you can place your game object and where the lines they describe the adjacency and how those uh, spaces uh, work with each other. So one way to describe a tic-tac-toe space is that it's discrete because the placement of the object is single points, so they're, they're discontinued. And the boundaries is basically where the cells um, should be. And it's two-dimensional because it's in 2D. There's has a width and a height. Um, Another example of a discrete space would be a chessboard, uh, which is basically the placement of the game object is on any of the cells of the 8x8 two-dimensional discrete space. Can you guys think of um, another example that's similar to this? Of a two-dimensional discrete space. Yes. Chinese, checkers. Uh, Chinese checkers, that's one, yeah. Candy Crush. Uh, Candy Crush to some extent, yes, that's correct. That's absolutely correct, because it's grid-based, the objects are placed within the, the grid, and then the, the adjacency and the location of the game object, it's what defines the spate, not where they are. So, let's have a look at another example, at some point. <laughs> this is not working again. <laughs> yes, so let's look at the, the space of Monopoly, right? So. Following what we just discussed, the space of monopoly and the fancy graphics could probably fully into thinking this is also a two-dimensional um, space um, that is discrete with the locations. But in essence, if you really think about uh, how monopoly actually works, it's more like this. It's more of a one-dimensional space with discrete points. It's one-dimensional discrete points because the end, uh, sorry, the end space actually just loops to the first. So um, this is important when you try to analyze um, a game space in general, so try to, do, uh, to remove the aesthetics on how, on the presentation of how the game is and try to analyze what the, what the space actually presents. So it's really 40 discrete points that connect itself in a loop, basically is what a monopoly space looks like. Uh, uh, a football field is an example of a continuous space. So the placement of... Uh, a player within uh, a dimensional space is, uh, is different if it was, let's see if the laser works, yes. So a player is here and a player is there, that makes a whole lot of difference. So that's a continuous space, it's not discrete points. The players could be anywhere within the space. Uh, the, the fields of the goal is the boundary of the space. And one could say that this could be a 2D space if the ball does not leave the ground, right? If the ball leaves the ground, the height is increased and that makes it a three-dimensional continuous space. Yes, you have a question? The area here around the goal. Uh, and not at all. So, like the area between the goals, so the placement of the player, if it's here or here, or if like a couple of pixels difference, it makes a whole lot of difference of where the player is in the game, right? So, that makes it a continuous space. A discrete space means that it's a series of uh, points that are connected somehow. So, like in checkers, it's one cell, it's the second cell, the third cell. The placement of the piece within the cell makes no difference as long as it's within the cell, right? So why are we doing this? Why are we analyzing spaces to begin with? Um, if, you, if you consider the space, right, and if you consider the elements that within the space, changing something within the space alters the game almost entirely. And this is what I mean, like, if you consider the, the borders of this continuous space here, and you change that a little bit, that creates an almost entire game completely. If you consider, uh, for example, if this is a 3D space, right, and if you consider adding hills and valleys to the, to the football field, that also changes the space entirely. So analyzing what the space is and then kind of trying to adjust objects within it helps you think of how you can affect the game of a game design perspective. I'll give you another example. If the goal is, to, uh, what is it, two meters? If you make it five meters, that changes the game entirely. Height, right? <laughs> or width. Those are the aspects that you can change within the space to kind of uh, affect your game design almost entirely. 
These are examples of games that you might have heard of with continuous spaces. Uh, where the game objects such as Mario, uh, the Mushroom, all of these things are placed within the world makes a big difference. Um, it's also a continuous space. So Mario being here or Mario being there makes a big difference as well as the Goomba movement. So it's a continuous space 2D uh, within the space as well. The 3D Sonic game would make it a, th a, three a third dimension in continuous space in which the game is taking place as well. There are some games... Um, I need to make it down. There are some states that nest space together. So there are some, space, there are some games that have um, continuous spaces. Like uh, this is uh, from a, an old RPG, Final Fantasy VII, if you guys know it. So as you walk through the, the overworld, you can walk in any direction you want. There's no particular points in which you need to move. So it's a continuous space. You can walk everywhere. Once the battle starts, then everybody is in their uh, position. It's a discrete space within the battle. You issue the command, the, the command happens, but then the player is back to its initial state. So it's, and it's the discrete space within a continuous space. And if you think about it, we often think of spaces in separation. So like, why are we here in this room? We're thinking of the space that we're in, but we're not really thinking that we are five stories high. We kind of disconnect where we are in our current space with the spaces outside. And layering games in that way also helps us make them closer to the real world. In RPGs, it's very common for the character to be as high as a mountain, right? And then they will encounter a village icon, and once they uh, touch the icon, they're in the village. The space is discontinued. There's not one continuous space for the whole game. Obviously, some games do that differently, but these are just examples. And there are some games that take space in no space. <laughs> so consider a game of charades, for example. Most of the game is taking place in people's minds as they're participating with it. We call that a zero-dimensional space. So um, the, the, the idea that the, this guy is trying to, con uh, to convey, it's in, it's in his head, and the people are trying to guess what the word is by having conversation with itself. There is no um, space in which this game is taken. Otherwise, obviously, you can say that everybody is in the game room, and that's an another way to analyze it. But in terms of the game itself, in terms of changing rules, it's all within the players themselves. So why, why bother think of spaces to begin with? This sounds like we're overcomplicating things that should be simple. I'll give you an example. If I tell you, um, consider that I'm making a video game about pool. You know pool, like billiards, I guess is what you call it. Um, a lot of people might describe it as a 2D space, right? A 2D continuous space. Some people might think that you can bounce the ball over, make it a, three, a, third, a, three, a 3D space, right? Some, there's some skilled players that can hit the ball in the right angle, make it bounce to fall on another ball, right? And this is where you as a game designer could change things. So you could decide that billiard is a two-dimensional two two continuous space game. Bouncing the ball is not allowed. And when you're presenting that to the players, that will make sense within the world you're creating. You could also uh, consider that within a billiard space, there are holes in which you need to puck the balls in. But you could also think that I want those holes to move change the game entirely. Considering how you want to define the space and alter it changes the game design drastically. And also, if you, if you strip it down, if you forget that you're making a pool game and strip it down into the definition of what the space is, it helps you uh, move past what we have in the real world and create fantasy worlds of your own. The second part of game mechanics is objects, attributes, and state. Uh, this will probably be a lot more familiar with you guys if you work with game engines. Objects basically is what's in the game. Basically, it could be characters, props, tokens, scoreboards, UI, anything. Anything is an object, right? Uh, as long as you interact with it, hear it, manipulate it, smell it in some games, this is a game objects. And objects generally, they have one or more attributes. And one of those is generally where that game object's position is in the game. So uh, everything in the game that we interact with, characters, props, whatever, is a game object. Every, go every game object has an attribute. Every attribute has a finite number of states. So attributes are categories of information of an object. And every attribute has a current state. There's a really messed up here. <laughs> so the 
Let me try to see what this says here. Yes. So um, there are uh, there are different types of uh, different type of uh, of uh, states of uh, states within the attributes. So um, static attributes they never change state. Static attribute is, is uh, whatever it is for the for the game object. Dynamic attributes have a finite set of possibilities. I'll give you an example. In chess, the king has a movement mode attribute. It has three states: either free to move, or in check, or checkmated. This is one example of a game object, which is the king, um, the attribute, which is movement mode, and important states such as free to move and check, checkmated. In Monopoly, for example, every property on the board can be considered an object and has a number of houses attribute, which has one of those states, either no houses, one house, two house, three house, four house, or hotel, right? It also could have a mortgage attribute that has two states, yes or no. Can you guys think of uh, other states? Other game objects and states? Can you think of another example within chess, for example? Yes? For example, for the pawns, there is a state of the movement mode, uh, is the game of the game or not of the game of the game? 100%. 100%. If it's the beginning of the game, the pawn can move two steps. Or is that if it's not the beginning of the end, they can move one step at a time. That's absolutely correct. Um, for pawns, also, you could have, uh, they can have an attribute that has it been promoted or not. And uh, that, uh, uh, that could have different states after it reaches the other end, right? They can uh, promote it to multiple, uh, to, to any piece that's already dead or something like this. So that also is a finite set of states that you can arrive to. Yes? Yes, exactly. 100%. Is it possible, yes or no, and can you do it, right? Because there's a, a, a set of rules that you have to apply. Yeah, so th those, those are really good examples, actually. Uh, try to move on to the next thing. So thinking of states actually kind of helps you also design, uh, design how game objects behave as well as you're thinking about what the game object and what kind of attributes and states they're in. This is a state diagram of how... Um, uh, Pac-Man uh, kind of works. So uh, uh, these are that Pac-Man goes with. So they're in cage, they're time to leave the cage. Once it's time to leave the cage, they start chasing Pac-Man. This is one uh, attribute. And uh, if, if Pac-Man eats the pilot ball, they turn blue. That's another state. And um, if they get eaten by Pac-Man, they turn into eyes rolling and they go back to the cage. Uh, so you can, you can pretty much analyze um, how the, the game object is behaving, break it down into attributes and different states that helps you design the game and then maybe uh, put it down into this kind of chart, helps you kind of understand how your game is kind of behaving, how the attributes and states of the game objects are interacting with each other. It's, it's important to kind of think of, um, of, of, of states of the game objects within the thing. So let, let's imagine that um, um, a phone is ringing, right? How do you, uh, what, what, what are the states that you would be in to answer the phone? Do you guys have an idea? There's a phone ringing. What do you do? Yes? That's, that's one step, yes. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a really good one, yes. Are you enraged to hear it or not? Is it your phone or not? Is it somebody else's phone? Is it reachable or not? Can I reach the phone? If it's, if it's not mine, can I still answer it or not? So uh, th there's a lot of states that you can check and it will change entirely how the game objects interact and relate to each other. Usually the, the first thing that comes to mind, the phone is ringing, I answer it. But there's, when it comes to your designing a game object, there's a lot of different attributes that come to mind when it comes to that. Some states are public, some states are private. So it's pretty much, it's very similar to uh, how it works in scripting languages. Uh, sometimes um, you would be able to know what are all the states that are available to you for that game object. Sometimes we show you some stuff and we don't show you everything. And that could change the game great <laughs> in a great way. Uh, 
it's something that you need to keep ahead of games that usually force the player to be aware of too many states. If there's a lot for you to keep track of, that would usually overwhelm you. <laughs> and overwhelm the player trying to understand like how many states I'm trying to keep track of. So good design is usually um, optimizes the information that is shared between the game and the player, or between the, uh, the players themselves. I'll give you some examples. Um, in chess, for example, everything's public. Except what you're thinking, obviously. Oh, you can tell. But uh, other than that, in terms of what the game is designed about, uh, everything is there out there um, as you're playing it. You can see your movement, and an opponent can see uh, his movement as well as yours. So everything, all the states of all the game objects are, are public in front of you. Um, that could also apply to uh, Monopoly as well. With all the, everything is the public in it. Maybe when you pick up those cards, those are not public. Um, card games, for example, poker, it's, uh, it, it, it alters between what's private and what's public. So uh, there's the cards that you put on the table at the end is what you reveal that's the public, but for the most part, your hand is private to you. Can you, can you guys think of games that uh, alter between public and private? Yes? Yep, 100%. The fog of war, yes, exactly. <laughs> Perfect. Yes? And also any game that depends on luck, because whenever there's luck involved, you can't, you can't be public, you can't know what's going to happen. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, there's a point there, yeah. Cool. Anything else? Yeah? Okay, so it's a card game called Skibo, and you basically well, also for everybody at the table now, it's a game playing in public game, so everybody can now see what's going on. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's, that's also true. A game of Mahjong, for example, is also, um, there are some uh, tiles that you, have, you can look at, and there are some tiles that are available for everybody to see on the table. And like you picking a card or taking a tile or playing it also alters the game quite a bit. Yeah, so uh, you often hear this, right? The game is cheating. Uh, this happens when you're playing against the game that knows everything, right? That when you're designing a game, the game pretty much has all the information available to it. So you should consider that when you're, play, when you're designing a game that in which the, game, the player is playing against the computer or the machine or the AI and uh, the information is really pl playable, the game is really making decisions that enable the game to happen. Your thought process is making a different decision. The idea of a game is cheating is not entirely accurate because the game should know what's going on. But as you're designing it, you, you should enable it to make the decisions that will make the gameplay relevant and interesting for everybody to play in terms of altering between those states. All right, so we defined uh, the, the spaces, the game, uh, the game objects. Let's talk about actions. Uh, so actions basically, um, they can be broken down into multiple categories. There are operative actions, which is basically what, what is the player doing in the game. So, uh, so for example, in, uh, in checkers, the player can move the piece. That's operative action. Uh, you can jump an opponent's checker. That's operative action. It's basically uh, actions that the player can take themselves. Um, you can move the checker backward if it was a king. That's also an operative action. In Pac-Man, for example, you can move, uh, you can move to consume. Uh, you, you put the direction button, you move Pac-Man. That's uh, an operative action. Can you think of what operative actions you have available to you in Mario? You can jump, yes. What else? You can move forward, move backward, yes. Those are all like the, the basic uh, operations that you carry out as a player. The second type are called resultant actions. Resultant actions is what the game does based on what you, operative actions you performed. So there are actions that are meaningful in the larger picture of the world, but they're not directly caused by the player action itself. I'll give you some examples, back to checkers again. Um, you can protect the checker from being captured by moving another checker behind it. You did not actively put a, tr a protect action you moved another checker. Following the resultant actions, you protected it. You can force an opponent to make an unwanted jump by strategically placing your checkers, right? You can move a checker into the king row, and that will make it into a king. So you did the operative action of move, and the resultant action is that the checker turned into a king. Um, in Pac-Man, for example, can you think, can you think, think of some stuff for uh, resultant actions for Pac-Man, yes? 
exactly. One hundred percent. Eating the pill is a is a, a is an operative action. The resultant action is that the ghosts are running away, and you can and you can eat them. So this is where it comes when it comes interesting when you're designing games. The concept of emergent gameplay. So basically, the concept of emergent gameplay is the ratio between resultant actions to operative actions. This has this is a relative measurement of how emergent the gameplay can become. So elegant design comes from allowing the player to do few operative actions and the game to create a lot of resultant actions. So it adds a lot of layers of strategy and thought process. I'll give you an example about that. Uh, uh, before we get to that, so I'll give you an example. Let, let's say you're, playing, you're making a first person shooter game. In a shooter game, um, the operative action is for you to shoot. If, uh, if the gun, shooting the gun is your operative action. If the gun only kills the enemies, then you have a finite set of things that you could do, right? But if the gun can kill an enemy, but also break a window, also break the lock, or also break a tile that could fall on an enemy and kill the enemy, that creates a list of emergent gameplay for, based on one operative action that starts with. So how do you uh, create emergent gameplay? Add more operative actions. So the more operative actions you add, the more resultant actions you're going to get. So uh, if you feel that you don't have enough emergent gameplay happening in your game, you need to add a bit more operative actions to your game. Um, another way would be um, add actions that work with many objects. So the, uh, the gun example that I just used. So that's a one game object that's an operative action. It interacts with a whole lot of other game objects. Create resultant gameplay. That's another way to create emergent gameplay as well. Another way is that you can add goals that can be achieved in one way. So um, in many ways, you know, like there's, um, there's a standard gameplay action of like you can only achieve the game with one operative action, but you can also create, like I said, killing an enemy. You can have it by shooting the gun, having a tile fall over, um, you falling over an enemy resulting in killing him. Uh, you can create all sorts of different um, resultant actions based on uh, operative actions. That's another way to achieve emergent gameplay. And another way is to perhaps add more objects to your game. So uh, if, if you're adding more operative actions, that's one way, but you can also add more objects that can interact with one, your one operative actions in the game. So imagine a checkers game with maybe um, double the pieces. That will, uh, that will lead in a lot more resultant actions within the game, or with uh, adding a couple of more rules, which are operative actions that could change the game quite a bit. Uh, but at the end of the day, you got to think of that the, what the actions are basically define your game. And what I mean is that the, we often refer to the game basically as the main action that the player is doing. So Mario is a platforming game or a jumping game because that's what the action you you fall more the, you do most in the game. Um, Katamari is a game is a rolling game because you keep rolling stuff over each other and. Uh, uh, the farming game in Harvest Moon is basically what, uh, what defines the game because that's what you do most of the time, you're, you're farming. So uh, when, you, when you design an action, it's very important to, def to uh, think carefully about what's the operative action that you do because that eventually defines what your game is. Uh, so following back to uh, game mechanics, we define spaces, objects, actions. Now number four is rules. So rules basically define the space, objects, the actions, and how they work with each other. That's basically what the rule are. It's the consequences of the action, the constraints that the action has, and what are the goals. There are different types of rules. There's operational rules, which is the easiest to understand. It's basically this is what you need to do to play the game. If you bought the board game, that's the manual, basically. Those are the operators, the operational rules. That's the easiest probably to understand. Behavior rules, those are the rules that are implicit to the game. They're not actually stated, and most people naturally know as good sportsmanship. For example, if you're playing a game of chess, it's uh, part of the behavior rule, we're, not, we're expecting you that you're not going to go and tickle your opponent. Those, <laughs> those are behavioral rules. Where they're, they're implicit, you ex you're expect them to happen, they're never stated anywhere. Um, there's written rules. Uh, those are the rules that come to the game. There's a documentation, for example, uh, operational manuals, um, some stuff that you need to read in order to play the game. 
Uh, those tie into esports a little bit more. Laws, that's when you're playing the game in a, in a serious or competitive uh, kind of environment. Those are settings and, uh, and additional uh, rules that you add to the game to make sure that it creates an even playground. Uh, so, for example, in fighting game tournaments, uh, the law would state that you cannot change a character mid-match. You have to finish the game before you, you pick another player. Also, you cannot change characters more than once in a series of three. Also, you have to win three games, out, uh, two games out of three to win. Those are all laws that have to deal with the tournament itself. Those are not implicit to the game, but they actually affect how we enjoy it. And then there's advisory rules. Um, if you guys play strategy games a lot, then probably a lot of you look up um, uh, rules or like the best openers or that kind of stuff. Those are not inherently placed within the game, but they are usually rules that people follow to be able to compete, to be able to play the game. Well. Even in chess, there are like books written about uh, what are the best opening uh, moves. Those are called advisory rules. They're not inherently part of what the game is, even though it affects the way it's played. And then there's house rules. Uh, if you play board games at a friend's place or you play Smash together, there's often players that will uh, enlist some rules on you as you're playing. This will alter the enjoyment of the game, but uh, could enhance it, could decrease it, depend on your taste. But those are also different type of rules that are placed within a group of people that enjoy games together. But the most important rule of all is that games should have a clearly stated goal. Good games have, go the good goals have those three important qualities. The goal is concrete, achievable, and rewarding. There's nothing more frustrating than you working really hard to achieve a goal that's been stated for you and the payoff to be little. You probably remember the Mass Effect 3 fiasco uh, when a lot of the players reached the end and they did not find it rewarding after playing all three games. That's a goal that's been set for the players over three games and was not uh, considered rewarding by them, for example. The goal has to be achievable. There's nothing more frustrating than a game that tells you you need to get there and there's no mean for you to go there. Be sure that every rule, that uh, every goal that is done in your game is completely achievable. Concrete means that it's clearly understood by all players. Uh, some, some designers rely on the narrative to deliver the goal to the player. That is not a bad thing at all, but you've got to make sure that your narrative is concise and clear so that the goal is clearly delivered to the player. When you, when you play test your game, and you guys probably heard it quite a bit, when somebody uh, holds your game for the first time, it's like, what am I supposed to be doing here? I don't know what to do. I don't, I'm lost. I, I, I don't. That's basically not creating a concrete goal from the get-go. Super important. The last part of the game mechanics is skill. So just to revise them again, there are space, game objects, um, actions, rules, skill. Skill takes the mechanic from the game into the player itself. So um, every game requires the player to exercise certain skills. And uh, it could be from pattern recognition to actual physical skills. We'll go through the types of skills in a bit. Uh, if the player's uh, skill level is a good match to the game difficulty, then the player would feel challenged and will continue to play. If the player's skill level is way ab above what the game is offering them, then the game is boring. If the player's skill level is way below what the game is offering them, then the game is frustrating. Finding the perfect match between the skill and what the game is offering the player is super important. If the, player requires the, play, uh, to, if the game requires the player to level up their skill, the game should provide ways for the player to level up their skill. If it's a fighting game, you should provide a training arena for the players to be better. If it's a multiplayer game, a competitive game, the player should be playing against player of their same skill level. There's nothing more frustrating than you playing the game and then playing against the Grandmaster. Because <laughs> they're going to win immediately and you're going to get super frustrated. There are, very t there are different types of skill to consider as you're designing the game, obviously. First one is physical skill. Uh, <laughs> It requires strength, dexterity, coordination, physical endurance. I've, I've used the example of Dance Dance Revolution. This is like the most physical game I could think of, uh, which is you're literally dancing to, to, to be able to achieve with the game. But physical skills does not necessarily mean <laughs> dancing on a mat itself. It could also require um, knowledge of the controller or like quick execution of uh, complicated input. 
that's also a physical skill that the player need to learn. It doesn't necessarily, you don't have to work out a sweat, but, <laughs> but it's still um, tactile nonetheless. Mental skills, this includes the skills of memory, observation, puzzle solving. Uh, many puzzle games, actually adventure games, require a certain level of skill. If you provide a pu puzzle, puzzle design is a really interesting subject um, that ties into the mental skill and balancing the puzzle to the player's mental ability or to the average mental ability of your player is one of the trickiest things in game design. It's super important that when you're designing puzzles, you're, you're constantly play testing it with a bunch of people and seeing how much does it take them to figure out if better. Um, one mistake that game designers often make is that they're trying to outsmart the player. It's, it's very important to know that the player is also constantly trying to outsmart the designer. And for you to be a good game designer, you need to provide them with enough challenge to outsmart you eventually. Third type of skills is social skills. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean like how good or chatty you are with other people around, although that could be some, uh, good in other games. But it also includes reading your opponent, fooling your opponent, uh, juking your opponent, um, or coordinating with teammates. So if you're playing um, uh, MOBAs, for example, Heroes of the Storm or games like that, this requires significant um, coordination with team players that you basically cannot win without. So when it comes to um, figuring out what kind of skills you're working on, it's very important to list out what kind of skills that your game is focusing on? What are we expecting from the players um, to do? It's easy to um, fool yourself in thinking that your game is focusing on one skill. But other skills are actually just as important. So it's, it's very important for you to list out what skills that the, what is the expectation that the game is requiring of the player and how it can deliver it to them. And the skills that a player exercises go a long way to determining the nature of the experiences, so you must know what these are. So if, 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 the, if you're creating a fighting game, then you know that uh, for those particular types of player, getting better at the game is vital to their game experience. So you need to know that you are creating a game that is expecting that. You're expecting some kind of development arc. And if you realize that your game is focusing on that type of skill, then um, you should cater for ways to either harvest that, grow it, or make it noticeable for the player. And that will basically include all five aspects of game mechanics. So uh, I think for the last point on it, we'll give you guys with some references. These are really good books about uh, game design theory that I highly recommend. Uh, Art of Game Design is among my favorite books of all time. We recommend that. Uh, please feel free to contact me. There's my email and Twitter handle. And I write about games sometimes, so please have a look. Uh, if you have any questions or do you need any clarification, uh, please let me know. I will also post these slides on this blog so you can download them and have a read whenever you want. Thank you.